The Wall Street Journal calls our guest today one of the top 40 most influential people in financial technology. I am Mitchell Chadrow, your host, and this is The Listen Up Show. Trusted friends in the Listen Up Show audience, you are in for a real treat. Today's entrepreneur, our guest, Chris Skinner, has an excellent blog called thefinancer.com, where he discusses the future of banking, finance, technology, and digital banking. Chris is the author of the best-selling book, Digital Bank, and his latest book is Digital Human, The Fourth Revolution of Humanity Includes Everyone. Welcome to the Listen Up Show, Chris. How are you this afternoon? Uh, I'm hot. We've got a massive heat wave through Europe that's been running for a couple of months now, so I'm tanned and warm. It feels like Florida. Well, you know, summer is my favorite time of year, so I'm, I'm on all eight cylinders today. Now, now, I hear that you just spoke at Money 2020 Europe, which, of course, is Europe's largest fintech event. What were some of the highlights? Well, they had Steve Wozniak there, but for the highlights for me, it's probably the networking with many of the biggest banks and the most amazing startups and unicorns in the world. So we had Revolut there announcing that they've got 2 million customers, which is not bad for a small company that's brand new with no little history. Uh, we had BBVA, ING, and some of the big banks there, which um, is something that I hadn't seen in some of the money 2020s before, in that the banks have finally woken up to the idea that they want to partner with fintech companies. And equally, what was amazing is a company like TransferWise, which is another fintech unicorn that said for many years that you should leave the bank, are now announcing that they're delighted to be partnering with the banks. So the collaborative atmosphere is something that's really starting to show through. Now, I see you do quite a bit of speaking, and I know that later on this month, you're actually going to be at the Island Shangri-La Hotel there in Hong Kong on June 29th for the Digital Bank Boot Camp, and you're going to be actually speaking on building open and pure digital banks into the future. Can you at least provide us some key thoughts prior to that conference? Yeah, I mean, I spend pretty much every day of every week on a plane flying to a conference to do a keynote or to network with startups, fintech companies, technology companies, and banks. And the one at the end of the month in Hong Kong is uh, just after I've been in New Zealand, and in between here and then, I've got a lot of travel around Europe. Um, And what I typically am talking about is the open sourcing structures of the digital bank model and Right now, most traditional banks are far away from this model, but some get it, and I think it's really about uh, taking what used to be the lovely charts that everyone liked to show called the unbundling of the bank, and now we're talking about the rebundling of the fintech. And so it's really about rebundling uh, apps, APIs, and analytics from many partners around the world that do something particularly well and delivering amazing customer experiences through open source structures that banks, because they have history, millions of customers, billions in capital, and are trusted because of their licenses, can deliver to the end user, which if they get it, they'll survive. If they don't adapt to that model, then bye-bye bank. Yeah. You know, I really enjoyed reading your latest article, When an App Replaces 1,200 Bank Branches. Can you tell us what the main message in that article actually was? Yeah, I mean, the main message, and I should say that I blog every single day, so um, suffice to say that when one stands out, it's amongst hundreds that I've written, so uh, it's not something top of mind. But what I remember when I wrote that article is that uh, Bank of America is opening 500 new branches, but by the same token, say that the volume of traffic that's coming through that app is equivalent of what used to be the traffic coming through 1,200 bank branches. So what you really have is a massive presence through the digital outreach of apps, APIs, and analytics in devices. Um, But at the same time, and that's the main message, you have to still have a physical presence for trust. And one of the banks I often refer to is Care Banca, which is an Italian bank launched in 2008 during the financial crisis to take business away from the other physical banks in Italy, but their strategy as a digital bank has been to open branches as a marketing investment. It's not there for transactions and service and administration. It's there purely for trust because when you have a physical asset, they, as Kebanka will testify, have 
two and a half times more assets under management than they do where they don't have a presence because the people trust that they can walk into the Brent branch and see the money. Show me the money. So that's the message, which is you, the physicality builds trust, the digitality builds reach. Let's talk about your latest book, Digital Human. Now, you actually did a case study in the book on Ant Financial. Tell consumers and financial services professionals in the United States in particular what they should actually know. Well, the book has probably four key backdrops. The first is to explain that digital is not just an evolution of what we've done before, but a complete revolution of humanity, because for the first time ever in 200,000 years of humans on Earth, um, or some would say 7 million years, but 200,000 years of Homo sapiens on Earth, uh, we're networked together in a combined hive of 7.5 billion people through the mobile system, which has never happened in history. Um, and with that big backdrop, the second theme, therefore, is that you cannot do what you've done before cheaper and faster with technology. You need to rethink what you've done before using technology as the ground swell of building the next generation of business. And in particular for banks, the third theme is, therefore, to start with this open-sourced apps, APIs, analytics structure and rethink your business model around the digital global connected planet. And finally, the theme is around inclusion, which is uh, two out of three people on planet Earth until the mobile network and the Internet connected everybody were excluded from financial services because it was too expensive to deal with them through physical services. Now, with digital, you can serve everybody, whether they're on the plains of Kenya or on the top of Mount Everest. And yeah. that, me that message is what Ant Financial has got, and they've been working on this message for several years now, to go out and work with partners in Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, Pakistan, India, many countries, and deliver financial inclu inclusion through their experiences, capabilities, and technologies. So they export their APIs, their apps, their analytics to local partners like Paytm in India that's now become one of the biggest mobile wallets in India in just a few years thanks to that combined experience and capabilities and technologies from China working with an Indian local partner called uh, Paytm run by Vijay Shakashama. And one of the big messages out of that, and this is what I think a lot of people in the West don't get is that in Europe and America we've got infrastructures, particularly for financial services and trade and commerce, that were implemented in the last century and many of them before Mark Zuckerberg was born. So for those of you who try to use MasterCard on May the 10th and couldn't get your Dunkin' Donuts, that's a good illustration of that problem. And yeah. now with someone like Ant Financial, um, they've built a system that's handling, on average, 125,000 transactions per second. Um, and co by comparison, Visa handles 2,000 transactions per second, so 125,000 is big. And every single transaction has artificial intelligence and machine learning applied to ensure it's not a fraudulent transaction, that it's managed with risk that's minimized. And they're scaling that in the next couple of years to be a million transactions per second average. The numbers and the scale is immense, and it's global, and it's completely inclusive of every human on Earth, and it's transformative. And before you know it, you'll see many of us in Europe and America are probably using technologies coming out of China with local partners like Ingenico, Verifone, um, First Data, and not even realizing that it's Chinese technologies powering American and European companies. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more in depth about Chinese versus U.S. payment system. The revenue versus the United States revenue is just incredible. It, it almost reminds me of the way the smart card technology was developed in France before really the, the magnetic strip, and, and that's the reason why it, it, it was so pervasive uh, there in France. And, you know, we've already had our own infrastructure already here. So to, to obviously move from to move from the already infrastructure that we already have, you don't have the same thing going on in South Africa and Indonesia and China, for example. So can you talk to us a little bit about about that? Yeah, I mean, if I'm honest, the southern hemisphere is where the future is coming from, and the northern hemisphere is where the history exists. So when you look at um, chip and pin in the USA, for example moving from MagStripe and um, Swipe 
Um, it's been a long process. It's probably taken much longer than everyone expected, and it's way behind Canada and way behind most of Europe, but it's now there. Um, and we used to smile about the fact that Americans were so reliant on checkbooks because paper systems are disappearing fast. Having said that, they don't need to disappear fast if there isn't a good alternative. In the meantime, the Southern Hemisphere, and China is a great example, um, and so is India, and so is the African nations like Kenya and Tanzania and Zimbabwe and Uganda, you know, they're all countries, and also Latin America, should say Colombia, um, Brazil, Chile. They're all countries where most people didn't have any access to banking. They didn't have credit and debit cards. They didn't have checkbooks. And so the mobile network operators and the technology giants have been rolling out services for these people that's made it very easy for them to pay, to save, to invest, to borrow. And as a result you've seen massive new financial giants appearing that just weren't around a few years ago. And it's typified because of the scale of India and China. So that's why I keep coming back to India and China, because when you've got over a billion people, you have massive scale. You know, these companies have more people using their systems than the population of the USA. And in an illustration of that, in 2017, Chinese citizens use mobile phones to transact over $15 trillion, which was triple the number of 2016. In 2017, American consumers transacted through mobile wallets like Zelle and Venmo about $150 billion. So you've got a scale of $15 trillion in China versus $150 billion in the USA. And it's mainly because Chinese people never had plastic. They never had paper checkbooks. They've leapfrogged us. And the same as I, you know, I see happening across most of the African nations, in Philippines, in Indonesia, in South America, the Southern Hemisphere is leapfrogging the Northern Hemisphere. And what's interesting about this as you're speaking, one of the things that I'm recognizing is that Alibaba just actually became a top 10 global bank. It's possible that some of the consumers even here in the U.S. are not even very familiar with Alipay and Alibaba. And can you talk to us about that? Because uh, that, that's, that's just unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, Alibaba is worth $500 billion, and Financial, which is the sister company that does their payments and savings and investment services, is valued at $150 billion, which, as you say, makes them the 10th most valuable financial conglomerate in the world based on their market valuation. Um, I recently hosted the launch of Digital Human in London and had the head of and financial for Europe on a panel discussion with the UK chief executive of Barclays Bank. And in the middle of that discussion, uh, Lee Wang, who from uh, and financial, said that the average Alibaba employee generates $16 million of revenue a year, the average employee. Meanwhile, the average employee of Barclays Bank generates about $400,000 a year. And this is the difference between FinTech and TechFin. In Europe and America, with our legacy infrastructure, we're applying technology to the existing financial structures to create cheaper and faster banking and, and payments and services in finance. In Southern Hemisphere and China, in particular, they're starting with a technology and looking at how can the technology be applied to exchange value between people to enable them to pay and save and invest. So it's technology first rather than finance first. And that's one of the big differences. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that this really goes to traditional bank evolution to the fintech company revolution that we always are, are hearing about in the fintech space. Can you elaborate on, on that, uh, that concept a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I talk a lot about platformification, um, which is the platform and marketplaces like Amazon and Alibaba uh, are designed to connect people who have something, in this case, something they want to sell, with people who want to buy that thing. Um, and that's made them massive commercial entities that then move into adjacent markets that drive more commerce through their platforms. So the motivation behind Alibaba moving into payments and lending is to get more merchants selling on their platform and more consumers buying on the platform, exactly the same with Amazon. It's not they're trying to get into banking, it's they're trying to get more commerce on their platform, and if banking and payments and lending enables that, then they'll get into banking and payments and lending. And going back to your point around the Chinese phenomena, I mean, I've been talking and blogging and writing about what I've seen happening in Chinese financial services for over a decade, and I was almost lynched in an American conference in 2006 
when I started saying that these Chinese financial institutions would become the biggest in the world. At the time, they weren't even in the top ten. Seven of the top ten biggest financial institutions uh, ten, uh, you know, ten years ago were American. Then we had the global financial crisis, the IPOs of these Chinese companies, and now the top four banks in the world are all Chinese, and only two out of the top ten are American. So what I was saying a decade ago has come true, whether we like it or not. A decade from now, what I'm pointing to is the fact that the Southern Hemisphere is showing us the future of financial services. And it's not about having a bank account. It's about having systems that, through technology, can allow us to connect in real time, peer-to-peer, and make a transaction happen, whether that's to borrow or invest, save or pay, immediately in real time, end-to-end across the corners of the earth. And these companies, I'm talking about particularly the Chinese and Indian ones, get that message big time. We don't in Europe and America so much because we're stuck with a lot of old infrastructure. We've talked about a lot of different names in the fintech space, and we've also mentioned a lot of traditional banks and and those that are challenger banks. Maybe you can tell the audience a few examples of those who are actually doing it well on the front end of fintech, and then, of course, those in the back office that maybe they're not as familiar with. Yeah, I mean – one of the things we talked about at Money 2020 is business reincarnation, which is destroying the industrial revolution business model and reincarnating for the digital revolution business model. And the big difference is that the bank business model from the industrial revolution is built for the physical distribution of paper in a localized network that focuses upon buildings and humans. And the digital revolution demands that we reincarnate that business into a digital business model for the digital distribution of data to a globalized network focused on software and servers and try and work out in that new model where and when buildings and humans are needed, if at all. And typically, the number of buildings and humans will be at 1%, maybe 5% max of what was there in the industrial era where you had to do a lot of heavy lifting. Now, the banks that get that business change are very few because what most banks are trying to do is to do digital as an evolution of what was there before and keep on doing what they've always done, cheaper and faster with technology. So they're creating what I call a faster horse, which is going back to the Industrial Revolution before the automobile arrived and Henry Ford. Everyone imagined the future would be faster horses or automated horses using steam power, whereas actually what we need is a new, completely different vehicle for transportation which became the automobile and very few people imagine what that would be until they saw it and could see it's a better horse in fact it's nothing to do with a horse it's a completely different vehicle and that's exactly what we're seeing from the southern hemisphere which is this reinvention around digital and some northern hemisphere banks do get this i normally point to bbva in spain um, dbs in singapore uh, USAA, Capital One in the USA, and, might be, and it might be surprising that I now also point to JP Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs. And the reason I point to the latter two banks is that I can see the transformation happening. It hasn't finished. It's a journey. It's in a continuum. It doesn't have a destination. It's non-stop to re- incarnate the bank from being a physical structured entity for distribution and service to a digital structured entity for distribution and service. But they are getting there. And in fact, there's a great chart I saw the other day of J.P. Morgan's marketplace of partners that are delivering digital services. And they're doing exactly what I'm advocating, which is becoming a curator of a marketplace of thousands of companies where as consumers or corporate users, we don't want to go out and do due diligence on a thousand companies that have no history, no brand, no trust. But if the bank can do that for us and then bring them to us and say, we've done the due diligence on these guys, you can trust them and we love them and they're our partners, but they give you a thousand times better experience than we could ever give you because they specialize in just this one thing, such as onboarding customers or making payments online. Fantastic. That's exactly what we should be getting. And that's exactly what Goldman Sachs, BBVA, JP Morgan, DBS are doing, which is why I pick them out. And in fact, the last thing I'll say about this, most of those companies, apart from Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, is that they're run by people who really have technology in their DNA. And the biggest issue for most big banks is they're led by bankers that have no technology people in the leadership team who have ever had a job in technology professionally. And therefore, they have no idea what they're doing when it comes to technology. They think digital is just rolling out a mobile app. That's completely wrong. And so when I hear you use words like journey and digital banking, 
and I look at the space right now, it's probably only about 1% finished, which is really exciting because there's so much to come down the pike in even the near future. Absolutely. I mean, right now we're on the cusp of a lot of further change. We've got artificial intelligence, machine learning, distributed ledger technology and blockchain, quantum computing. We've got so many things that are still emerging and evolving and haven't yet matured. And you have to realize, you know, that digitalization and technology is still a very young revolution. It's only 70 years old. You know, the Industrial Revolution is almost four centuries. Um, so this is still very young and it's still going to work towards a massive transformation over the next 10, 20, 30 years. You know, the idea of the singularity, which is when machines become as intelligent as humans, is still probably about 12 to 15, maybe even 20 years away. And the robotics and everything else that comes with that is still a way away. But what will happen is that this will completely restructure our world. And everyone is worried about it, but I'm not. And the reason I'm not is that I can see thousands of new jobs being generated in new industries like fintech and in these technology spheres that I'm describing and in things that will become multi-planetary exploration as Elon Musk get and Jeff Bezos take us into space. So I liken it to, uh, you know, if you had gone back a century ago and said to your great-grandfathers that all of their jobs would disappear in the next 50 years and none of them would work in farming. They'd probably lynch you, but that's exactly what happened. And I think we're in the same moment now in this fourth revolution as we go through this big digitalization change. Most jobs that exist today are going to be decimated, but new jobs will appear and we'll be doing different things. You know, you mentioned blockchain, and I know that I've already mentioned two of your books, and what most people should also realize is that you've actually written 12 others. And in one of your books, Value Web, you talk about how fintech firms are using Bitcoin blockchain and mobile technologies to actually create Internet of Value Blockchain Insider. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the winners in that space? Um, who are some of the winners to continue with into even next year, for example? Yeah, I mean, it's been interesting with uh, the development of cryptocurrencies because they're now a decade old. Satoshi Nakamoto's paper was posted at the end of 2008, so this is a thing that's been around for a long time now. And in fact, it didn't actually start with Satoshi Nakamoto's paper. You know, cryptocurrencies and the whole idea of encryption dates back 30, 40 years, so it's, it, this is not new. Uh, what is new is the idea of a ledger that could be recording transactions without human hand involved that could be completely trusted, and that's what actually is the whole interest in the blockchain, because when you record something on a blockchain, and that blockchain as a term wasn't even used in Satoshi Nakamoto's paper, but it was about recording transactions using the network to uh, verify the transaction rather than any human. And because the network could do that in an immutable way that's tamper-proof, you could completely trust that when the transaction is recorded, that did happen at that time in that way, and no one tampered with that transaction. So it's something that's the Internet of Truth. And that developed into Ethereum, which became contracts that you could trust and went way further than just recording payments transactions and currency transactions. You could record any transaction from selling a house to getting married. And this is transformational foundational technologies. But what we've just realized, in, and in particular in the past few years since everyone got very excited about this technology, is yes, it's going to transform everything we do in business, in government, in life but it's going to take a long time to get there because we have to have governments and institutions agreeing how these infrastructures work. And again, going back to my idea of faster horses, uh, you know, blockchain distributed ledger technology is the faster horse, but we haven't worked out what it's going to carry yet. We haven't defined its cart or its payload or its wagon or whatever it is that goes behind it. And that's the bit that now is the hard work that everyone's putting a lot of effort into. They've tested out these technologies. They can see they can work. And now they're all working on the idea of, okay, so, for example, if we're going to replace all of your passports and driving license with a digital ID, how will we agree to do that? And who needs to be involved to agree that? And how will we structure that technology rollout? And that's something that's going to take five to ten years. You know, I also heard you mention AI, and you also mentioned Elon Musk. I just saw that 
survey that came out that, that named him number three in the top 50 AI influencers in the fintech community for 2018. But, gee, as I scan down that list, they're making it in at number 50 is Chris Skinner. So, you know, today we see this face-off in tech between the slow and stuffy traditional banks and those who actually have and embrace innovation like AI and blockchain technology. You care to give us a few examples there in terms of what's happening in AI and maybe some additional thoughts there? Yeah, first of all, say I know the list that you're referring to, and it's completely bogus because. <laughs> so no don't believe there. don't believe anything that you read. Don't believe these lists, right? It's it's fake news. If you think Elon Musk is not one of the top influencers, and that Mike Kozagi or Spiros from Europe is, <laughs> yeah, you're completely nuts. That's just. Fun. <laughs> I, I got you. Okay, I'm going to quote you on that. I don't have to ask you one of your one of your uh, quotes for today because I'm. I think I already have it. <laughs> yeah, well, let's do this way. None of those lists take into account that my blog gets 5,000 page views per day because they don't take into account my blog, which is kind of <laughs> a big mix. Um, but going back to AI, I've got some great examples of how AI is changing the game. And my favorite ones come from companies like JP Morgan Chase, where in one second they can analyze their corporate client contracts with their commercial clients using their AI engine that historically would take 360,000 hours of legal time to do just that one second's piece of work. So we can get rid of a lot of lawyers, which is great news. Um, they also use AI for best execution, which is really complex. When a client makes an order in the investment bank, the guarantee you have to give is that you'll give the best price at the lowest cost, at the fastest speed, at the highest likelihood of achieving settlement in a nanosecond. No human could do that, but their AI engine is doing that, which is why they've risen to be one of the top three investment banks in the world from nowhere five years ago. UBS, one of the big wealth management companies, can use AI to implement client instructions from emails in one second that on average used to take 45 minutes for a human. So AI is really changing the game in client servicing, client intelligent marketing, fraud, risk analytics, regulation compliance. It's going to be massively uh, transformational for banks back offices because of the cost savings it delivers and that's why banks are really excited about that technology far more than blockchain because they know blockchain will take maybe five to ten years AI takes maybe five to ten months or less let's talk 2019 bank challengers you see a lot of the neo banks that are now actually looking to get traditional bank licenses can you, and, and, you know, I'm thinking of Movin, for example, and, and some of the others in, in the neobank space. Can you talk to us a little bit about what we're going to see going forward and, and why moving, uh, having some of those neobanks moving into the more traditional type of space that we're seeing now? Yeah, I mean, the challenge for challenger banks is to actually come up with something that's different to, to traditional banks. A lot of them have uh, imitated traditional bank products and services in digital apps and reach, and it's not really transformed the model or the product, um, although some are doing that, like Moven um, in the USA and Monzo in the UK. And the big difference is that they're using intelligence around the customer to drive more smart services and advice to the customer so that you live your life smarter, you spend smarter, you save smarter. Um, and that's what it's all about, actually understanding your financial lifestyle and making you feel like you're being given a cushion in that lifestyle to avoid getting into a mess. I mean, I love the example of Loot, which is one of the challenger banks in the UK, because it's created by a 21-year-old university dropout. And can you imagine dropping out of university to launch a bank? That would have been impossible <laughs> just 10, 10 years ago. But Oli Perdue, the leader of this bank, has done it. And I said to him, why? Have you done this? And he said, well, I'm at university, and the one thing I need to know is, can I afford to go out this weekend and party? And my bank's app only ever told me about last weekend that I shouldn't have gone out and party, <laughs> because they only told me what happened in the past. They never tell me about the future. Yeah, and that's right. what you guys do. You, you mentioned the UK, and so how about 26? What are, what are your feelings there? Yeah, and 26 has grown very nicely from uh, a few thousand customers to a few hundred thousand customers, and they're expanding across Europe because they have a passport to do that. Uh, but they're not the only one. I mean, you have Bunk in the Netherlands. Uh, you have quite a few new companies coming out of Spain, out of the Nordic region. Um, and what you really see is a massive innovation and vision coming from millennials and young people. And this is one of the key messages that I point to about 
but nearly all the fintech startups have been created by people who are under the age of 35. Some of them are even teenagers. I mean, John and Patrick Collinson, when they started Stripe, were 21 and 19 years old. Um, Vistler Buterin, who's created Ethereum, is 19 years old when he started Ethereum. So teenagers and millennials are reinventing financial services using code and software and servers. And the traditional bank is run by a bunch of old men who don't even know what's going on. These are really peers now to the banking, those that have banking licenses. They have large amounts of customers. They have credible substitutes for the banks that have actually been around for hundreds of years. You have all the big Wall Street banks that they've stood up and they've taken notice, I'm sure, over these last several years. Any advice for them in 2019 and beyond? I think the main message is get digital, get digital in the DNA of the bank, change the culture of the bank through strong digital leadership, change the C-suite in the bank to make sure that it has a balance of technology, digital people, and banking compliance regulatory people. Don't have it all skewed towards the financial world, which is what most boardrooms have. Most bank boardrooms have no one who's got any knowledge of technology. And in a recent survey that I saw where they, uh, there was an analysis of the experience of the C-suite and boardroom members of the biggest banks of the world, the statistic is that 94% of the individuals leading those banks have never been in a role related to technology. Change it, otherwise you'll die. I really hope that these banks are actually listening up to you because what you're saying is so very true. You know, I, I also look at it akin to the risks of obviously not doing it. I mean, for those that have not already changed over these last several years, I mean, really in the short term, and I say three to five years, what happens to them, not to even mention what happens to them seven to ten years long term looking out. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a blog recently about it's three minutes to midnight, and if you know the midnight clock, that's when the whole world um, implodes and we have Armageddon uh, with nuclear warfare. Um, in this case, this is digital warfare for banks, and I'm saying three mi minutes to midnight for traditional banks. And what I mean by that is you've only got a very short window left to transform your infrastructure from the last century that's not real time, that's product focus that's fragmented across the organization so there's no single view of the customer to get with it so you can start to compete with the Amazons and Alibabas and get digital and get really intimate with customer data and leverage that data so the customer feels it's worth dealing with you and if banks don't start this journey with, by 2020 then it's probably going to be too late for many of them. I mean, you know, we're talking about investments here in, in this new this new digital age, and yet if you actually look back these last 30 years in terms of investments versus the returns, whether we're talking about the big banks like BNP and, and HSBC and RBS and even the Bank of America, really, I mean, you know, the one word that really comes to my mind is it's really been underwhelming, at least for those big, stodgy, older, traditional type of banks. So you would think that they would get the message that they really need to start increasing the investment in this particular space, like you said, by 2020. Well, I mean, I come back to one of the big digital banks in the UK. I'm a customer of quite a few of them, and this particular one claims to be far ahead of the others in digitalization. Um, and they have one of the best UK banking apps, according to their own surveys. Um, and on the Apple iTunes store, the app is rated 4.8 out of 5 with thousands of votes. And yet, I think it's one of the worst apps that I'm using. Um, and the reason I say that is that... Uh, which uh, one was that? I'm sorry. Uh, it's one of the big banks. Um, uh -huh. I'm not saying which. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's fact, fine. I just didn't realize. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, most of them are the same, to be honest, which is they tell me what I've spent. But in particular, the one reason I go into this app three or four times a day is that I'm trying to find out, has my customer paid me today? I'm waiting for my customer payments to come in. And what I really like is an alert that says, you just got m money. So I don't have to go into the app to find out I just got money. The app tells me I've just got money. They can't even do that because their back office system is written in the last century as a branch ledger system of transactions with nothing that gives proactive. So advice. who's doing it right? I mean, who, who's doing it right at this at this oh. juncture? I mean, who who is the person to be looking at? A great example is Monzo as a startup challenge in the UK. It's viewed as one of the top UK challenges because they've got 500,000 customers 
on their prepaid card, of which 93% have now converted to their full service bank. And one of these great examples of what they do is that if you travel every way on a subway and spend $10 every day on a subway, their machine learning engine recognizes that you're a bit silly because what you really should do is get a season card for six months or a year. But unfortunately, it recognizes that you don't do that because you never have $2,000 in your account to afford an annual season ticket on the subway. So they'll alert you and say, we see you going on the subway every day, spending $10, to $10. you're wasting $1,000 a year you really should get a season card for $2,000. Would you like one now? Click or swipe. And if you click or swipe, you get the season card. You actually get it through a minimum interest rate loan, but you don't see it as a loan. You see it as, oh, wow, Monzo's, at, Mo, Monzo's actually looking at what I'm doing. They understand me. They recognize that they can help me, and they really have. Thank you, Monzo. We've talked a little bit about open banking, APIs, the open marketplace, and I see there in London our good friend here from the U.S., Vernon Hill, who obviously started Commerce Bank and it was sold to TD Bank, Metro Bank. Can you tell us a little bit about that bank generally and in terms of where you see that going over the next few years? Yeah, I mean, I know them pretty well. I knew Vernon from Commerce Bank before in the States and uh, also Sir Duffy, um, the dog that he has, which is so, uh, <laughs> it's a very dog-friendly bank. Um, <laughs> and basically, they launched... Um, well, and that's really the first bank that went to seven days a week, at least here in the United States. Before banking was even done on a Sunday, for example, his bank, Commerce Bank here locally, they started here in this area where I'm at. I'm right outside of Philadelphia. Went to seven days a week. Yeah, and they've done the same here and no, no stupid banking rules. They offer night boxes and night safes, which no other bank really does anymore. Uh, they offer coin counting machines in the front of their branches, which no one else does. Um, but my my kids that. love that. I, I remember as, as little kid, take them in to the bank there. They would give away the free commerce banks to the kids. Now, of course, my daughter's graduating high school, going to college. But I'm saying when she was four and five and six years old, and they still remember that, I mean, very fondly. Yeah, and you know, they, they've got that same U.S. model in the U.K., but now they've taken it a step further. So they are now profitable, which is pretty good going. They're on target. They've grown to probably about 40 branches in the last count I saw. Um, but they believe they will now double their customer base from 1 to 2 million customers using digital reach. And this has been a bit of a challenge for Vernon personally because he hasn't understood digital. But luckily, the team at Metro have, and they've convinced him now that digital is the way to go, complementing physical. And I think that's the key thing that I was relating earlier on with Care Banker and in my opening statement, which is if you realize that digital is the foundation and it's all about distributing data through software and servers in a globalized network, and then identify how the buildings and humans sit in that network, the answer is they sit in that network to provide a great customer experience and a physicality of a store for those people who want to have the eye-to-eye, face-to-face conversation about things, which I think many people still do because money is emotional. It's not something that's tangential. It's one of the most important things in our lives behind intimacy with our partner. And that's a core of humanity. And that's the reason why I say what's happening right now is the fourth revolution of humanity with everyone connected on planet Earth. And Money and intimacy in that digital structure is changing everything, as you'll see in my book, Digital Human. Here on the Listen Up show, we love books. I actually have a book club back at mitchellchadro.com slash books. All of our guests that come on always recommend a good book. Of course, I always provide a, a link back to that book. To get today's show notes, I want you to head over to mitchellchadro.com slash show 71 Chris, we've talked about so many different things in today's show. We want to thank you very much. Everything that we've discussed will be back there in the show notes with links. If you actually want to check out other Listen Up shows, you can always go over to mitchellchadro.com slash blog. We're in iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Type in Listen Up show and you'll be able to get that. Chris, any final thoughts before we say goodbye? Um, I guess the final thought would be that whatever you think the world is today, give it 10 years, it will be nothing like it is today. 10 years ago, we didn't have an iPhone, we didn't have Facebook. Imagine a decentralized internet where you own all of your data and you have your own identity that you control and Facebook no longer abuses you. That's the world of 10 years away probably. It's already started. 
We already mentioned your blog. We mentioned, obviously, your latest book, and we're going to have links to all of that. Any other way that the audience can sort of reach out and say hello? Chris underscore Twitter at uh, Twitter. Um, and equally, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn. You name it, you'll find me. I'm a shouty voice. I try and make it. Well, we're going to make sure that the Listen Up audience sends you a lot of different tweets and connects with you on many different levels. We want to thank you so much for all your time and all your in-depth knowledge in this particular space. And we were just so thankful and grateful to have you on the show. Too kind, Mitchell. Great to connect with you. And I used to uh, work for a company based in Norcross and Bluebell, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Bluebell, it's right around the corner. That used to be my stomping ground. I know it well. Oh, I can't stand it. You're right. <laughs> so, I mean, because right now I'm actually in Montgomery County, right outside of Horsham in the Willow Grove area, right in Upper Dublin. Well, I know Bluebell very, very well. Isn't that, that, that you know what, Chris? That's a small world. <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. Uh, my main memory of that was going over to Lancaster County to see the Amish. So, uh, you know, it's one of those. Well, I'll tell you what. The next time you're in the States, I'm going to personally take you to the Bluebell Inn. How's that? That sounds like a deal. All right, Chris. Hey, thanks again. You take care, and we'll be talking to you real soon. That's it, Mitchell. Be good now. Bye-bye. Until next time, my trusty friends, sign up for my email list at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Please provide a well-written review in iTunes. Go over to mitchellchadro.com slash iTunes. It takes two minutes, but it helps others find the show. Subscribe anywhere. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, or any popular podcast aggregator. One of my favorite is actually Overcast.fm. So if you head on over to mitchellchadro.com slash overcast, you can subscribe on that podcast aggregator. Thank you again, and I look forward to our next show.